Hey, hello guys. Hope you are enjoying the conference. Um, hope you had like cool talks. Um, so my name is Alfredo. I'm a threat research leader on my team. And I would like to bring you this, um, this talk right now um, about serverless security. Um, but just before I jump into the into the main um, topic of this talk, I would like to present a, um, be presenting myself and my whole team. Uh, we are a small team inside from a micro organization we call a Nebula team. And here are some quick stats of the whole team to um, just introduce ourselves and our work so you can uh, further dig for uh, other information as well. So we are um, a small new team. We established ourselves as this team in 2018. And since then, we currently have 19 publications. Uh, last time I, I compiled uh, the publications, it was September 10th this year. Uh, we have, uh, we probably have some um, more out there by, by the time I'm, I'm recording and you were seeing this talk. Um, 14 of those publications uh, were published on Tremicro blogs or dedicated landing pages. Um, two of them publicated on 30-part DevOps magazines. Uh, we currently have a pipeline with um, 15 other publications uh, on different stages. So we have legal teams analyzing, we have marketing team analyzing, we have peer review when we write something. Um, and we are probably launching those uh, really soon. Um, so we have two conferences presentations as a team um, and three thread models, uh, which is a pretty cool thing. We, we usually um, start this process to bring more intelligence to the product teams and thread teams to feed our, um, our like several teams. Uh, and then we, after all, we publish the, the end of the work as a piece of a blog post or, or a landing page. We've been doing that for DevOps, Kubernetes, and infrastructure as a code. Um, pretty cool. I would recommend you guys to take a look. And finally, um, one research paper, which is this one, um, the main topic of this, this presentation, um, the serverless one. Um, again, um, I promise that those are the less uh, uh, facts about the team. So we are not um, a vulnerability hunting team, but sometimes we come across uh, with some vulnerabilities and uh, we do the proper disclosure. And usually we submitted those to the ZDI. So on um, those less than two years, we've submitted 23 um, vulnerabilities to the uh, ZDI program, which is pretty cool, uh, especially for a small and young team. Um, okay, so this is uh, basically a baseline. So I want just to introduce, uh, do a introductory uh, topic. Um, so serverless, serverless architecture, what is that? So I hope there are some people in the audience that ever heard or experimented server serverless. Um, so this kind of, this is kind of a buzzword right now. Uh, the main concept is it's quite simple to be honest. Um, so the major CSPs, they come, they came with this, um, this shift of, hey, you don't need to take care of the whole infrastructure anymore. Um, we are going to take care of everything for you. You just have to to care and protect and develop your um, your service that you're going to provide. So everything below that, uh, the whole infrastructure um, from um, everything that is not your data, your code, you are safe, we are taking care of this. So this is basically what serverless means. Um, it is services in a customer perspective, but no servers. So this is the, this is one example of a very simple web application, and some of uh, 
of the serverless services that we can have to get this web application up and running. So I'm going through some of them. For example, um, AWS or Amazon S3 bucket. So we are going to talk more about um, S3 buckets later on, but basically they are there for you to upload static files. And you can also have a simple uh, HTML or static language-based um, uh, web page there, right? Um, Lambda function, it's another um, service that AWS provides. So it runs your code and gives you uh, an output of the, the, the code. Right, so you trigger it somehow. Uh, in this case, it's uh, an API trigger. Um, it runs your code, it gives you the return, and that's it. And it, it's done, it's dead. So you're not, uh, you don't have to have a server running 24 by seven. Uh, if someone access your page and then some that person leaves and your server is still running. No, so the whole concept of, um, a Lambda function, it's to run when it's called and dying after all. Um, we also have like, a, um, a, a again, a, another keyword here is be ephemeral. Um, so the data is not saved, or I should say supposedly not save, saved. So it, it runs, it's triggered, it runs and it dies. Um, and also, uh, there's another service called DynamoDB. The name says it all. So it's a database, right? So if you're, let's say this web page is, um, it's um, a blog, you want to write a review. So you write, sorry, you write your review on DynamoDB. Uh, you don't need the server. You, don't need the, you just need the service uh, of having access to the tables, blah, blah, blah and you insert it and you don't have to set up like a whole infrastructure to have a, a database running. Uh, that again, it, it's quite a buzzword and there is basically no uh, new technology um, presentation without this, right? So paradigm shift. Um, I would like to introduce um, two shifts for you um, that was something interesting something I've learned and something that was, those were like real changes that I saw along this research. So the first one is responsibility shift. So if you uh, are a customer of a CSP, you probably heard at some point about the uh, responsibility model, shared responsibility model, right? Where the CSP has uh, certain responsibilities about the data, about the infrastructure, and the customer has its own uh, responsibilities, right? We uh, serverless, this stack is pushed up because the customer doesn't have any responsibilities on the operating system, on the uh, container runtime or a micro VM runtime. No, it's just about its own data and its own code. Um, and another paradigm shift and this one, it, it, it's quite interesting, is misconfigurations versus vulnerabilities as the way we know right now, like the well-established vulnerability model we have, right? So those are kind of more rare because the whole infrastructure that would be exposed it's not anymore, like not even to the customer, right? So the attack surface or the, the point of attack that one attacker could uh, have an impact are never or now. So what we see instead is misconfigurations. So I try to be very clear on my, on my serverless um, paper that AWS tries to make sure to implement on all the services, the least privilege um, uh, model, right? Where you start without any privilege, without any access, and then you start giving access to different services to communicate with each other, to communicate to outside world, and there we go. 
Um, but then we have what we call misconfigurations. It's basically where the uh, user of the account needs um, certain um, uh, specific configurations or specific um, communication um, between services. And instead of mitigating that and releasing uh, or configuring that to be very punctual, very specific communication, the user goes there and gives more privileges than needed. So this causes several um, different problems. Um, so those are uh, characterized more like misconfiguration than vulnerabilities. Um, but again, those those are like huge problems. I'm going to show actually show um, some examples later on this presentation. Um, so we saw that the uh, surface of attack is much more narrow now and what's left to attack. So at the same point that this shift makes things more secure, um, it, it, it also on the attacker mindset and I'm, I'm going to present something like this. When I was working on this um, this paper, I at some points I had to have this mindset, like a uh, red team, if you will. So what's left to attack? So what are the uh, points on serverless services that I, uh, I can attack or a problem can happen? So configuration factor again. So let's start with S3 buckets. So we can have, um, I listed here two points open and or public, public accessible S3 buckets. So the S3 buckets um, are services, is a service that I can place any kind of uh, data or file that I want to um, process later on or just to backup or whatever, right? And it also um, offers you the option to make it public, to make it available but it's not by default. And again, going back to the one of the uh, last slides, um, AWS tries to make sure that when you upload something there, it's not public, right? So you have to, like you as a customer, you have to go there and you have to configure that to be open and public accessible. Um, so I see two problems happening, digging around. I, I see lots and lots of, um, uh, very known websites that teach people, oh, if you are going to use S3 bucket, so the first configuration I have to do is, is that. So you go there and you open your S3 buckets, then you are able to upload your files uh, no matter where you are. And uh, um, a different team inside Trend Micro called FTR, they've also uh, launched um, um, a paper about cloud in general, and they highlighted something like this. So how much these how-tos make people commit mistakes like this, misconfiguration mistakes like this. Um, so I, I have here one a very good example of this. This is um, uh, an Astro bucket used by um, a web store. And every um, couple of weeks, they make a backup of the transactions, the uh, sales, the purchases they do, and they send all of these to be backed up on an S3 bucket. So it's public, you can see um, all the files there and you can download them actually. And those are very sensitive files to be there and to be publicly open. Um, another problem that I found is um, S3 buckets are, um, are are uh, meant to hold static files, right? So it it means that if you have a static language, um, web based web based language, you can upload your file there, and it's going to be like a landing page, HTML, for example. Uh, that's not true for PHP, for example. Uh, I've, I was able to find a couple of websites or a few of them, better saying, um, uh, that are meant to be hosted on S3 buckets and the language of the websites were uh, script-based languages, uh, dynamic languages like PHP. 
Uh, and what happens when the language, um, the code is not interpreted? The problem is the whole page, like the whole code is going to be exposed. And inside the code, you can find things like uh, database passwords, uh, path to sensitive files, and that's a huge problem. And again, human mistake, it's not a, a problem of the uh, infrastructure, it's a problem on configurating the service to better fit your needs. Oh, Lambda, Lambda is a good one. Lambda is um, it's something I've dedicated my uh, most of my time. And to be honest, I started this whole um, uh, trip on serverless with Lambda. That was my main service to explore. Uh, and I've I've had I had some key points here that I want to talk briefly about. And again, I, I'm bringing some of the points of each service. And if you want to deep dive and if you want more information, please go to the, please go to the uh, research, Trend Micro Research website and download uh, the, the paper PDF. Uh, so Lambda, so what can go wrong with Lambda? So the first and foremost, bad or vulnerable code. Um, so when you are developing the your service code, you have to have you have to ensure that this code is well developed, developed with the least um, communication um, to other service or only the needed communication to the to to other services as possible. Neat um, something it, it's pretty common is using public libraries. And sometimes those libraries are not um, either um, reliable or secure. So it's not rare to see bad or vulnerable code out there to be used on, on Lambda service, services. And again, on the, on the paper, I give a couple of screenshots of GitHub examples, uh, Stack Overflow examples, where I found I could find some really bad code to be set as, a, as example or full services there. Um, another huge um, problem, and again, I give some examples as well on the paper, leaving sensitive data exposed. Um, so on this example, I, I, I show how some IDs and um, secrets are exposed depending on how you develop your your code or how you make your Lambda to be triggered. Um, saving credentials as, as variables. Um, so this is a huge problem and this is something I've uh, submitted both to ZDI and AWS. Um, AWS does it on, on, on the micro VM of Lambda. So as you can see here, and this is going to lead to something else by the end of the presentation, I'm going to show you a POC. Um, and it, it's also not rare to find projects, uh, small and, and, uh, and huge projects where the credentials are saved and exposed on public repositories. Um, and again, I glimpsed on, the, on the, my first example here. So using uh, vulnerable libraries is a huge problem as well. Um, copying bad code from online repo or not only repo, but also when you see people giving advices on places like Stack Overflow um, with very bad examples on how to solve a problem and sometimes solving a problem using like giving more permissions like or indiscriminated permissions. It, it's not a better way to solve a problem. And it, it's, it's far from rare to see this happening. Um, and something else that was pretty cool during the um, this journey, file persistence. persistence. Um, so Lambda should be ephemeral, but it happens that for a short period of time, and it, it goes from eight minutes to 12, if I'm not mistaken, um, you can you can find the files inside, if you keep triggering the same way your Lambda function, you can still find your files there. 
Um, and then again, I, I do a PLC and there is a YouTube video on that, that I, I download a bunch of, um, of samples that I'm going to, or files that I'm going to use for further attack inside the Lambda that um, turns out that those were persistent, those kept there, even though it, it should be ephemeral. Um, so API Gateway, API Gateway um, gives you a way to talk to between services or to a service specific service to, for example, trigger Lambda. Um, so the two uh, critical factors that I found and I highlighted here is, um, so no security or uh, authentication policies by default, which means when you are setting up an API gateway, um, you are not asked or you are not, um, I don't want to use the word forced, but you are not uh, instigated to apply security on that. Right, or authentication on, on your API, uh, which can be a problem. So if you were, um, you were new to that, or if you, you were developing without a security mindset, you might leave some, um, some APIs open to the, to the world, right? And that can lead to a further attack. Um, and it also leaves lots of footprints as the as the screenshot here shows. So if you are interacting with the API gateway, it's pretty easy to guess and it, it's pretty easy to map. Again, I had for this exercise, I had to have this attacking mindset, red team, if you will. Um, and one of the first steps is um, it, it's determine what you are dealing with. And this is made this, this headers um, of API gateway make it like really easy to, to detect. Um, so the AWS um, I am, so where you give, this is basically where you give permissions um, to services, to users. Um, and again, this, uh, this is a service that you can find lots and lots of misconfigurations out there. So, um, I, I give you here two examples. The first one uh, on the left side is uh, a policy, pol I am policy written, like well written, giving um, permissions based on like, the service and what the service can do to another service. And on the right side, you can see like all those stars. Uh, it means do whatever you want. So when you see like a whole lot of stars, it's not a good sign. Um, yeah. Um, so PLC and attack. So when I put everything together, I wanted to, to have a case, right? Not only uh, bring some external examples that I, as I gave examples on all the services here, but I wanted to do something on my own to show that this is important and uh, an attacker can exploit and can take leverage of like the whole thing, right? So I've developed something. And again, I've, I've, um, I've sent everything both to ZDI and to, um, and to AWS. But the whole premise here is I have a Lambda. Um, and what my Lambda does is my Lambda controls my EC2s, my other service. Therefore, I give it, I grant it permission to my Lambda to manage my EC2. And what I have to do is I have to go through an API gateway and send the commands and send the AC, EC2 names. And I can stop, I can start, I can manage my EC2s, right? Um, so, and I, purposely left um, my code bed written there where I can um, I can escape. So where I, in the place that I should give the name of my EC2 instances, I purposely uh, de bad developed that for escaping with a semicolon and be able to execute shell commands. And something, when I was um, deep diving on Lambda, something that called my attention was the, um, the 
credential credentials saved as variables like environment variables here and working on with AWS CLI and the serverless framework, those were the same uh, credentials, so those the same variable names that I had on my machine when I used the the tools and to manage my whole AWS machine um, account. Sorry. So I had this idea. So what if I was able to not just execute a um, harmless command like uh, PWD or who am I or whatever here. What if I can download AWS CLI to inside the Lambda running machine? And if it goes well, would those variables authenticate me and allow me to jump from one service to another? And that was the POC I, I've done. So. Spoiler alert, yes, those um, credentials, they authenticate my AWS CLI. And just for uh, POC, what I do, I change my, um, my Lambda permission, my Lambda runtime from two minutes to 15 minutes, which is the maximum for a Lambda to um, be allowed to be running, right? But I could go crazy and create uh, different machines. I, I could, um, well, whatever, manage the account with the permissions that Lambda had at that time. So that was just a POC. Again, uh, on Trend Micro um, YouTube, there's a video of this process going on, like very technical video. Um, you can have more details on that there. Uh, but that was a cool journey, and I could prove that um, this such attack can happen, and that can be uh, very harmful. Um, so talking about um, harm, um, let's talk about some attack impacts. Um, and again, here, I, I'm not here to sell any Trend Micro product, so I'm going to talk in a very generic um, very dynamic way. So when I have a, um, my environment compromised and this attack can, or like I, I just showed you happens, what can happen? What can go wrong? So the first thing I, that came to my mind was credential, credential and account theft. So depending on how much uh, permission I, I gave to my Lambda, I can create a new user, I can um, dump the, uh, the name of the other users, whatever I can, uh, get, or in the simplest case, I can just get the credentials and, um, that were saved as variables and used on my machine. Uh, and again, sensitive data and code theft. So the code is actually saved inside the Lambda machine. So I can, get that code if it's something that um, has something sensitive that should not uh, see the light of the world, I can uh, rob that. Uh, privilege collation, uh, I could move to one service to another, I could create users for my own. Again, if the, um, if the Lambda had permissions for such, right? Um, misusage of researches that generates cost for the account owner. So here I had something very specific in my mind. In my case, my Lambda had access to uh, manage permissions to EC2. So I could create several machines that are mine Bitcoins. By the way, this is a huge thing on um, specifically container attacks that we've been seeing. So I could put that for like a whole month mining um, crypto mining, and after this month, the account owner would see the I spike on the um, on the bill, right? And persistence. So, if I, I I run slow and I run stealth, I could be there for future attacks. Some security security measures, and again, not here to sell any trend micro product, but what what could be done to to prevent that? Um, so first of all, establish a good code review process. So 
Uh, most of the problems um, that I, I saw during this, especially talking about Lambda, started with a bad code, right? Or a vulnerable code or a good code using a bad library, public library. Um, create better permissions and compliance procedures. Um, it's, it's very easy to follow all the permissions manually when you have a small project, but uh, when you, your project grows, uh, it can be very hard for your compliance to, if it's manual, to follow all the permissions and keep, uh, keep this least privilege in mind. Um, so having a tool or having a third-part company to, um, to reveal that and to uh, apply the compliances, that's a, a good strategy. Um, avoid leaving footprints. This is again huge, and there are like several services, including AWS services, that work like a load balancer or a gateway or a WAF or you name it that stays in front of your exposed application to make sure that no footprint is going to be left behind. Um, and last and foremost, so use application security solutions that protect. Um, the application um, in all layers of attacks, right? Um, again, I'm, I'm not going to much into details here. Uh, we have um, not much time left, but the um, a simple WAF cannot prevent all time of all types of attacks, right? So um, something really cool about protecting Lambda is you can protect as a layer. And no matter um, where the attack come from, you can still protect it, right? Because again, Lambda uh, here on my on my attack, I had an um, API gateway set up and my attack happened through HTTP, but I could be, be using uh, email to trigger my Lambda. I could use Slack to trigger my Lambda. So having... Um, a product that protects all kinds of layers, um, uh, sorry, protects as a layer, all kinds uh, of attack, that, that's awesome. And that would be everything. So thank you if you stayed to the end of this presentation. I leave my email here just in case you, you guys want more information. Um, feel free to reach me out. Um, Again, I invite you to go to Trend Micro research page, look for this, um, this paper. You can download it. It's free of charge. It's a PDF format. Um, the video of the POC, it's also linked on the landing page. And I hope you all enjoyed. Um, and that's it. Bye-bye.